For three days. Three days, Dr. Watson. Neither food nor drink has passed his lips. And he refused a doctor? Simply wouldn't have it. And you know how masterful he is. Yeah. I didn't dare disobey him. I understand, Mrs. Hudson. Is there any more you can tell me before we get there? Very little. He took to his bed on Wednesday afternoon and he hasn't moved since. And before then? Any clue as to what brought this on? All I know is he's been working on a case down at Rotherhive, an alley near the river, and now he's so wasted the bones are sticking out of his face. Good God. Why didn't he send for me? Heaven knows. He'd only agree even to that one. I wouldn't stand it any more. With your leave or without it, I said, I'm going for a doctor this minute. Mm, good for you. Then let it be Watson, he said. And thank God you were free to come at once, sir. Well, of course I would be. Because he's sinking. All these three days he's been sinking. Oh, Holmes is stronger than any man I've met. He's dying, sir. Mr. Holmes is dying. The Dying Detective by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Dramatised for radio by Robert Forrest. With Clive Merrison as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr John Watson. And featuring Edward Petherbridge as Culverton Smith and Alex Jennings as Victor Savage. The Dying Detective. Well, Watson, we seem to have fallen on evil days. My dear fellow, don't I... Don't I look evil? These hands. I can't stop their cursed twitching. As if they itch to get hold of a throat. Now stand back. Stand right back. Holmes, if you approach me, Watson, I shall order you out of the house. What? No closer. No closer. Not an inch, not one inch. Or out you go. Holmes, you are ill. Clearly, you are very ill. And I am a doctor and your friend. Yes. But what manner of doctor? I beg your pardon? What do you know of Tapanuli fever? Eh? What do you know of the black Formosa corruption? I've never heard of either, but that doesn't mean I... There you are. A friend is a friend, but facts are facts. And it's unquestionably a fact that you are only a general practitioner with very little experience and mediocre qualifications. Such a remark is unworthy of you. It shows only the state of your nerves. It does pain me to say these things. But you leave me no choice. (laughs) Very well, then. If you have no confidence in me, let me call in Sir Jasper Meek or Penrose Fisher, any of the best men in London. There's only one man in London knows more than I. What I have is a coolie disease from Sumatra, of which only this is certain. It is infallibly deadly, and it is horribly contagious by touch. Watson, contagious by touch. You keep your distance, and all is well. Can you imagine for a moment that risk would matter to me? Hmm? It wouldn't keep me from my duty in the case of a stranger. And my qualifications as your friend are surely not in any doubt. One man in London. Of course, Dr. Ainstree, the greatest living authority on tropical disease. He's in London all this week. And now I'm going to fetch him. Watson, with or without your leave. I may always in the past have deferred to your wishes, even when I've least understood them. Watson. But you are ill, and I am a doctor. Whatever you think of it. Good God. Now, firstly, Ainstry is not the man. Holmes, you are... Secondly, you shall not leave this room before six o'clock. Do you expect me to believe? No, perhaps not. But I, I might shoot myself or any poor fool who comes bungling through the door. Now... Best to lock it, just in case. (laughs) With this infernal trembling and twitching and the revolver so heavy, who knows when it might go off, yes? Where the bullets might fly. Now lock the door. Mm. Do it, my friend. Good. Now, throw the key onto my bed. Oh, Oh dear. You're the poorest shot as I might be today. Now do sit down, old man. That's a good fellow. It's four o'clock now. It's six. You may go and fetch our man. This is insanity. So it is. But it must be endured for two hours. If you wish, you may read. But, But I would be obliged if you'd refrain from smoking. I've got a tail on 
fold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul, did I deserve thy knotted and combined? Combined, eh? Yes, combined, <laughs> combined locks to yes, each particular herd and stand. Put that down! The box spread down! I was merely admiring it, Holmes. Carving of the ivory, so. Don't delicate. leave my things alone. They're mine, they're the mine, and they're dangerous. Contagious, Watson, contagious. <laughs> By touch. <laughs> Don't you listen? Yes, I listen. I hear the irrational ramblings of spite and my professional instinct and my my regard for you. In an are... agony of impatience? Yes. Yes, but you won't take the key from me by force, will you? Uh, uh, forgive me, old chap. Uh, let's talk of other things. Mrs. Hudson. Ah, yeah, this is this is yes. an admirable woman. Mm. But surely not sufficiently fascinating to be the subject of our conversation. Well, let me call her. Let us at least try to have you eat something or, or a drink. Yes, she is, I admit, with me as her tenant, a long-suffering woman. Oh, I, I, I freely confess I'm not tidy. My chemical experiments, although they've been of remarkable benefit to the science of deduction, are often malodorous. And there is your occasional indoor revolver practice. Oh, indeed, indeed, yes. You must bear in mind the revolver. <laughs> Yes, the good woman must often feel uncomfortable here, with celebrated criminals staring at her from every wall. Embezzlers, kidnappers, stranglers. Poisoners. <laughs> These are only portraits. Sometimes she is face to face with the real thing. Yes, on the other hand, my payments are not niggardly. Oh, I understand they're princely. I dislike and distrust her sex, but I, I think you'll admit that I've always been a chivalrous opponent. Yeah. Yes, whereas I... I would be a, a callous exterminator of oysters, of whatever gender. Oysters? Yes, yes, vile creatures, yes, vile and wantonly prolific. Yes, but uh, then no doubt there are natural enemies which limit their increase. And, and, and you, you, Watson, who never did fail me, you and I, uh, yes, we've done our part. No, 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 no. The word, I'm, I'm almost sure, will, will not be overrun by oysters. It's, it's horrible, thought. It's horrible. Holmes, I cannot bear this. You must let me go for this doctrine of yours. What time is it? Uh, uh, 5.15. Then you, you must bear it for 45 minutes more. Then you, you may fetch Mr Culverton Smith. I never heard the name. Who is he? He lives at 13 Lower Burke Street. And? And what? What is he? What's his specialty? Uh, rubber, for the most part, and, and oil, uh, yeah, coffee and, and tea. Rubber? Uh, yes, and, and, and pepper. I forgot the pepper. Holmes. Uh, yes, I, I, I must say I'm surprised you haven't heard of him. Yes, he's one of the best-known residents of Sumatra. Sumatra? Yes, in the East, Watson. There are many problems of disease, many, many strange pathological possibilities. I learnt a lot during some recent researches which had a medico-criminal aspect. Yes, in fact, it was in the course of them that I, I contracted this complaint. And Coverton Smith, he can help you? An outbreak of something very similar wipes out half his labour force. He's a planter, you see. Yes, his plantation is distant from any advanced medical aid, so he, he studied the subject himself. Be clear now. You do sincerely believe he can help you? His knowledge of my condition, I assure you, is unique. It has been his dearest hobby. Yes. <laughs> and he's not even Dutch. <laughs> he is, however, most methodical. You won't find him at home before six. Yes, your sentence won't last too many minutes more. Yes, I, I, I would suggest a game of chess or cards. Uh, yes, but the risk would be too great. Uh, yes, uh, charades, perhaps. Oh, uh, yes, uh, l let me see. Yes, let me see the good Dr. Cavort in charades. Yes? But if the answer's an oyster... <laughs> the frolics waved. <laughs> Holmes. Holmes. Huh? It is five minutes to six. May I go for Smith now? Very yes, soon. It will take me till a good bit after six to get there. And what will you tell him? That you need him immediately. And how you left me? <laughs> what will be your informed medical opinion on that? That you are ill. Critically so. Critical, yes. Uh, would you please light the gas for me, but only halfway. <laughs> Carefully. Be very, very, very careful, oh. Watson. My eyes can't bear it more than halfway on. Is another symptom, perhaps. 
Oh, think of the miles and miles of pipe laid to bring so much gas all this way, merely to half illuminate a dying detective. <laughs> what dauntingly complex things are life, <clears throat> public utilities, and some martyrdom fevers. <clears throat> now, don't draw the blind. Mm? No. <clears throat> oh, well done. Oh, what a friend you are. Is there anything else you need? Shall I send Mrs. Hudson up as I leave? Uh, you will have the kindness to place here on this table within my reach those letters on the mantelpiece. Mm. Uh, use the sugar tongs. Sugar tongs? Contagion, Watson. Use the tongs. Apply the same care as you did to your admirably precise setting of the gas line. Oh, sir. Now I shall clear a space by putting my revolver under my pillow. That's it. Mm. Well, well done. Now, that ivory box, mm. whose delicate carving you so admired, bring it here too. I, I may amuse myself by deciphering its symbols. <coughs> oh, good. Now, you will persuade him to come. Watson, Calvert and Smith of 13, Lower Perk Street. Whatever it takes, he'll be here. Yes, beg him, pray him, bribe him, anything. Then hurry back here, when I shall issue what may be my last requests and instructions to you. You will be back before him. Uh, if you insist. I insist. You know, I always insist on proper attention to every detail. Just as I insist, you adopt a proper stance for your task. What stance? Uh, have you any change in your pocket? Yes. Yes? Yeah. Um, silver? Uh, 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 some. Uh, how many half-crowns? Uh, 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 five. Uh, better with more. However, we must work with what we have. Uh, put them in your watch pocket and the rest in your trouser pocket. Uh, no, 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 the left one, man. <clears throat> there. <sighs> yes, 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 yes. That balances you more pleasingly. No, no. Dawdle, no more. Take the key you so contemptuously threw on my clean coverlet. <clears throat> and be off with you. I'm sure you did all you could for him, sir. He let me do next to nothing. For two hours? Yeah. And now I'm to vet some amateur specialist he knows. We have to try everything we can. Yes, I suppose so. Let's pray there's a cab at hand. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Mrs. Hudson. Inspector Morton. Mr. Holmes is in, I see. Yes, but... I see, by the light, he's in. He's unwell. I did hear that. And seeing no one. Oh, well. Perhaps later. No, not tonight, Inspector. He is very ill. Oh, dear. And you're on your way to find his cure. Yes, I hope so. And I must hurry. Ah, there's a cab. Goodbye. Bye, Doctor. Good luck. Would you care to come in for tea, Inspector Morton? No, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. On duty. On important duty. Athletic tonight, the Doctor. Ooh, look at him run. Dr. John Watson, M.D., never heard of the man. Dr. Watson apologises for arriving without appointment, but says the time is of the essence. Uh, you know, I'm not to be disturbed in the hours of my study. Indeed, sir, but the gentleman does appear to be in a state of extreme... He can see me in the morning if he really must. Forgive me, sir, but he did lay particular stress on the urgency of his business. Life and death were his very words. My work may save thousands of lives, Staples. I must not be hindered. No, sir. And give him my message. I'm not at home. Very good. Tell this intrusive doctor to return in the morning if his business requires it. I beg your pardon, Mr. Smith, but my business cannot wait till morning. How dare you, sir? How dare you barge into my house uninvited? I am truly sorry, but this is a matter of life and death. I have a friend within perhaps hours of... Mr. Smith. You are the doctor, not I. Yes, but unlike you, I am no expert on Eastern diseases. And it is such a disease that looks set to take the life of... Sherlock Holmes. Of course, Dr. Watson. Forgive me, Doctor. I, I was so engrossed in my studies, the name didn't... Uh, you may go, Staples. Thank you, sir. Won't you sit down, Dr. Watson? Uh, no, thank you. It is Mr. Holmes' fervent wish that you visit him tonight. Within the hour, I beg of you. I know Mr. Holmes only by reputation, and, of course, I have every respect for his talent and character, but... What can have brought my obscure name to his attention? He considers you the one man in London who can help him. He is convinced his illness is of Eastern origin. He contracted it while working among Chinese sailors in the dockside area. I see. And his symptoms? He is fevered. His limbs are tremulous. Uh, his appetite? I, I believe it's at least three days since he's eaten. He's lost considerable weight. I haven't been able to examine him properly. He wouldn't allow it for fear of the contagion. I think he may be overstating that danger. But there's no doubt in my mind he's... Is he delirious? Yes, intermittently. Mm. 
Well, Dr. Watson, I can't be sure without seeing our illustrious patient, but I fear I know what ails him. It is a most virulent and intractable disease. But there is hope. We must never lose hope. And it is no false arrogance to say that if anyone can save him, I can. Then you will come. It would be inhuman not to. I've seen the ravages of this affliction at close hand. Yes, your plantation work is... It was that disaster that began my investigation of its causes and possible cures. And although I am only an amateur, but then so too, we might say, is Mr. Holmes. For him, the villain, for me, the microbe. You see these bottles and jars arrayed all around us? Yes. They are my prisons. Among these gelatine cultivations, some of the worst offenders in the world are doing time. And I, too, am a kind of prisoner condemned to a sentence of indeterminate length until I unravel the secrets of these malignants. Mr. Smith, will you come? Of course. Give me ten minutes and I shall accompany you to uh, Baker Street, is it not? Yes, but uh, I must ask you to make your own way there. I have another appointment, business, for Mr. Holmes. Very well. You can rely on my being there within half an hour. It will be an honour to bring whatever special knowledge I have to bear on Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Holmes? Holmes? Uh -huh. Can you hear me? I can hear you. But you are very far away. Not in my dream. No, in a dream in another room. I am no dream. I am here. Don't you know who I am? I shall identify you by rational deduction. Yes, that is my method. I think you are beyond rationality. I sent Watson to fetch Culverton and Smith. Watson never fails me. <laughs> Therefore, you must be Mr. Smith. Well done. Your brain is not yet entirely dysfunctional, I am glad. I hardly dared hope he would come. How could I not? How could I refuse the summons of the great Sherlock Holmes? And you will try to save me. Save you? Do you know what's the matter with you? Yes, and I know only you can help me. But can I? I must be frank with you. I know you'd want only the truth. I haven't yet cured one case of this disease. You know it wiped out half the souls on my plantation. Yeah. I could do nothing to stop it. I was like a man in chains whose house burns down around him. Yes, but since then you've studied, learned more about its horrible workings than any man alive. I, I, I know you have. I've, I've made the most extensive inquiries. So I believe. Perhaps you don't appreciate how disconcerting that can be to find out that the investigative genius of Sherlock Holmes has been directed at one's affairs. But you do claim significant breakthroughs in, in understanding the disease. Which, you will also have learned, killed my own nephew only two months ago. Yes, I know that. He died on the fourth day of his illness. And you have been like this, what, three days? Yes. But then Victor was a weakling. I hadn't set eyes on him for over two years until some ten weeks ago he invited me to lunch. Smith, please, help me. You must understand what you're up against. He was already on his second bottle when I arrived. When I saw that fleshy, sneering face of his, I almost turned on my heel and left. An oaf, Holmes. An oaf. And a reprobate. I won't keep you long, Uncle. I know this place isn't your style at all, but please do more than prod at your salmon. It's excellent. They know exactly how I like it here. I eat little at lunchtime, and this certainly is too rich for me. Uh, still keep to your monkish habits, eh? You said there was some business you wished to discuss. I thought any business we had together was concluded when my grandfather died. Oh, good man. Self-disciplined and straight to the point. I can see why your company did so well. Until your unfortunate plague, that is. We have recovered from that. But it has cost you a great deal, has it not? It hasn't been easy finding new investment. I do pay attention to the financial pages. No doubt. But that epidemic cost me more in grief than in money. Grief? Oh, you mean all the blacks who died, yes. 
I did hear you've become obsessed with medical research. Can't say it surprised me. I remember when I first came to live on Great Grandpapa's estate, you were what, um, 15? 14. And you were a six year old rascal, I know. While you were already the solemn young scientist collecting all manner of bugs and fungi, when you weren't elbow deep in scummy marsh water, you were poring over the driest volumes. Victor, why this sudden interest in my work? I haven't heard from you in two years. We have taken entirely different paths in life. But we do have some things in common. Do we? We are both orphans, both raised by the same benevolent relative. Your grandfather, my great one. Both now all alone and searching for some purpose in life. I have purpose. That you should search for such a thing astonishes me. <laughs> You're right. The grand tone doesn't suit me, does it? Looking for some relief from boredom, let's say, something solid in which to invest time and money. I have an abundance of both. Abundance can become tiresome, you know. And you want to relieve yourself of some of your abundance by investing in my company? Perhaps. Tell me about Sumatra. What do you want to know? Where is it for a start? Indonesia. South east of India. And it produces coffee and tea, money in those commodities. I deal mainly in rubber and oil. Some coffee and tea and pepper and native artifacts. Ah, what about the natives? Not respectable Anglican Tories, I'll wager. <laughs> They're mixed. Islamic, Buddhist, Hindu. Mm, that was one thing our mutual benefactor found distressing in you, your fascination with our dark-skinned cousins. They are a generous, graceful, intelligent people. And I had to watch scores of them die in misery and pain. Oh, but they've bred up again to a workable population, I take it. No offence meant, uncle. Do you have a consignment arriving soon? Next week. Mind if I pop down and take a look? If you wish. Jolly good. Now, do at least have a glass of Chablis. Even the most austere of monks will take wine for his stomach's sake, especially when his order's about to receive a sizable donation. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. It is, of course, tragic, tragic and strange that a young man should die of an obscure Asiatic disease in the heart of London, but all these details, they are of no relevance to my predicament. Oh, but they are. You said yourself. Victor hadn't the strength to combat his illness, but I mean to fight it. No, he had no strength. No strength of body, of character, of will. Only an easily made fortune, and he had one of those already, would have held his attention. And my researches, they meant nothing to him. But he did inspect one of your shipments. Hmm? So the docks, hmm? like me, where he contracted his illness. Hmm? Inspect? He stood there with a the scented handkerchief at his nose, looking round him with contempt at honest men toiling for a living. Good God, Uncle, do you spend a lot of your time down here? Not as much as I used to. It sounds and looks like utter confusion to me. But it's not. My experience of Dockside has been limited to drinking champagne on a liner, saying goodbye to friends. This smells like a Chinese dunghill. And in what way would that differ from an English one? Oh, don't sling that brothers under the skin nonsense at me. Would you pretend you'd easily turn your back on some of these roughnecks? Look at them. There could be pirates looting your ship. Some of them used to be just that. And no, I can't entirely trust them all, but my people at home in Sumatra... Home? Them I'd trust with my life. You know, sometimes I think great-grandpapa was right. You do have a dangerously lopsided view of the world. You forget, Victor. I've seen the world. You've been no further than the theatres and brothels of Paris. I suspect one sees what one wants to see. Your opinions were set years ago in great-grandpapa's library. From which, in the end, he barred me. However, any involvement I might plan in your exotic trade, I imagine to be a case of signing checks and receiving larger ones. Oh, I might peruse the odd map for fun and for comfort our financial statements. Certainly, I don't plan to be jostled and choked by your eastern chums. And watching barrels of oil roll down a gangplank does very quickly, Paul. Shall we go? There's something else you might find less tedious. Where? On board. What? Actually set foot on that floating slum. You'll be quite safe. And if your splendid shoes get dirty, you may simply buy a new pair. How could my grandfather have loved such a worthless fool? 
It would take more than your rational method, Holmes, to fathom that. The human heart isn't plumbed by deductive reasoning. My politics, my aspirations were anathema to him. But to take to his heart that patently dishonest and selfish brat, our home became his domain. He was the strutting prince in the house, the arrogant lordling of the whole estate. And then, with my being away at school so much of the time, by the time I was 19, he only 11 or so, he knew. Stand and deliver! Oh, for heaven's sake, Victor. Can I get no peace from you? Your money or your life. Where did you find that ridiculous mask? In a trunk in the attic. Great-grandpapa said I could have it. It was my father's. And was the pistol his too? No. Well, please, don't wave it at me. Play with your toys elsewhere. Stand still. It's not a toy. It's real. Liar. Shall I pull the trigger and we'll see? Go ahead, you little beast. Tell me where you've been. Walking, thinking, trying to escape from that irritating voice of yours. What are you thinking about? Apart from the fact that I long to be back at university with miles between you and me, my thoughts are none of your business. You're a threat to the Empire. I'm what? I heard Reverend Bissett say that. Thoughts are abroad that threaten our Empire. Great-grandpapa just grunted. They were talking about you. And from now on, any books you want from the library, you must check with him first. You really are an evil little monster. It's almost impressive, the poison you invent. I'm not inventing. Go and ask him. Look, see this squirrel? Oh, miss. Dear God. <laughs> you should see your face. Oh, you should see it. That isn't a toy, of course. It's real. It looks it. They're used for hunting wild pigs. A couple are thrown to bring the beast down. The kill is finished by others, stabbing. Mm, that would do it, yes. These knives aren't exactly playthings, either. Do you still hunt? Of course. Not keen on the riding, I must admit, but it's expected of me. Squirrels? Squirrels, hardly. The fox in the morning, old man. Bag the odd rabbit. But no longer squirrels with a pistol. You remember that? Oh, yes. Don't you remember the look on my face? God, I was such a devil in those days. You were? An ignorant boy. Indeed. And I thought perhaps some of your like-minded, fashionable friends might take a fancy to some of this. Well, you mean they might become the things to have? A pair of crossed pig spears on one's dining room wall, or one of these tom-toms to summon the servants? Can't see it, Uncle. It's not all such primitive stuff. Look at the carving this ivory. Exquisite. These combs. Boxes, necklaces. And these heads of Buddha. Hmm. Might look prettily exotic on the mantelpiece. Can we not have more light in here? Or these masks. You used to like masks. This one's corrupted Hindu. Corrupted? Yes. He's derived from Kalki. This demon, Kalki. An avatar of Vishnu. When he comes, all decadence will be wiped out. You do talk with frightful respect about all this mumbo jumbo. My distressing fascination with our dark cousins. Hmm. The island tribes people took over the myth, combined it with their own older stories, and summoned up this face. Ugly customer, especially in this half light. Are those tusks? Yes. He seems to be horse and boar together. Nobility and ferocity. He shall annihilate the wicked, the weak and deceiving, cruel generation which rules today. And then the world will be renewed. Uncle. What? I shall be going soon. Of course. But before I do, yes. the estate, it's your home, you know. I mean, you must come down. You really must. Any time you like, the hospitality will floor you, believe me. We can hunt and fish and... Uh, and the library is still there. And we can discuss our business. Business? Your investment in my demeaning little trade. Demeaning? Uh, not at all. Not with your... your enthusiasm. Yes, regular board meeting in the most pleasant surroundings. Why don't you try it on? I really don't think it would suit me. Imagine a ball on the estate. A fancy dress ball. I'm sure you enjoy such things. All your liveliest friends from town? Not a bad notion. Give it here. Picture your entrance. Is there a mirror? Yes. Uh, I'll hold it for you. 
I said it's a bit heavy. Cypress. Strong, enduring wood carved by true artists. So, all your friends are gathered. Candlelight, wine. They turn to the staircase, raise their glasses as you descend. Uh, God. Oh, I really can't see. You're in ceremonial robes. You still got that mirror? Lord of your domain. I can't get my eyes in line with... Masked as Kalki. Ow! Avenging Kalki. Your true artists were a bit... careless, Uncle. All thick-skinned. It's decidedly rough inside. It reminds me of something. Yes, yeah, a book I once had. The Boy's Empire storybook. There was a picture in it of a monster. You would make a most impressive monster. <laughs> Always used to hurry past that page. Anyway, I really must be going. I, I say, I think that damn thing drew blood. But you will visit us very soon. See the old place again. Take one of those meditating walks of yours. Yes. Yes. I'm almost sure I shall. Jolly good. Can't be monkish all your days. Now, could you lead me out of this gloomy dungeon? I hadn't made my mind up before we went down into the hold. Not entirely. Everything was prepared, of course, but as if in a dream. You still with me, Holmes? I do hope you can hear me. Four days later, I was the watchful uncle, his only surviving relative sitting by his bedside. Where he lay with my disease. Good, Holmes. I'm glad you're holding on. I set all your insects free. Yes. And put bleach in your fish tank. I know. And fired a pistol at you. Not at me, Victor. <laughs> You should have seen your face. Oh, my, what big eyes you have. Your money or your life. But Grandpapa was wrong. It was jolly nice of him. But it wasn't right to give me the house. My house. I'll make it all up. And I'll give you lots of money. Will you? Lots. That's my plan. Your plan? Yes. To make it all up. Surprise, surprise. So you can buy all the medicine. Make everybody well again. Uncle, I don't like that face. Tusks, big pointy ears. Like the picture in that book. Monster. Don't like it. Turn the page. Turn it. He would not have made amends. I know he would not. He would have kept it all and squandered it all. He was raving, hallucinating, dying. As you are. But you can cure me. Cure me, Smith. I'll forget it all. Forget? That you killed your nephew. I can do nothing for you. I swear. I'll not say a word. More worthless deathbed promises. But you're right. You'll say nothing. You'll be in no witness box, quite another shape of box. I've seen so many of those in my life. My parents, my sister, my grandfather. All my good, honest workers in Sumatra. But you didn't murder them. What? How dare you? I laboured and agonised with them for weeks as I fought to save them. I've given years and almost every penny I have to find a cure. When my grandfather bypassed me in his will, I didn't care. It was monstrous, but I didn't care. If Victor died, then the estate would revert to you. It meant nothing to me. I'd gone beyond their little world and all its prejudice and greed. But when I saw that wasteful hound again, saw how I could be rid of him, and all that fortune come to me, no! Not to me. To my research for the benefit of thousands. What? Please, please. Of course. For Victor, the device was simple. The needles inside the mask. I knew the clumsy fool couldn't fail to prick himself. And he needs only the minutest penetration of the skin. But for Sherlock Holmes... Careful. Take it slowly. 
For you, whose talent and astuteness I truly respect, it had to be more subtle. It could only be ivory for Sherlock Holmes. An honor that you think me so deserving. Ivory. Artfully constructed, intricately carved. Like this box here on your table, which I may as well take with me out of harm's way. You'll agree, Holmes, the device is cunning. The needle sharp spring is infinitesimal, almost invisible. Darts as you open it, then withdraws. A most elegant assassination. And I'm sorry, Holmes, if the elements hadn't come together in that unique mind of yours, and if you hadn't set Inspector Morton on my trail. The gas. What? Turn up the gas. Shadows begin to fall, do they? Very well. There. Now we can see each other clearly. And see the truth. Which is that Victor's death and yours will allow me to continue my work. Be assured, Holmes. Your untimely end will bring about the eradication of at least three devilish plagues. That is a comfort. Work of such importance I could not allow to be stopped. Morton I knew I could evade. His plodding investigation would never have got near me. But he let slip that you were behind him. And Sherlock Holmes was a different proposition. I had to be rid of you. And I repeat, I am truly sorry. Is there anything else I can do for you? Yes, yeah, since you're kind enough to ask. Cigarettes and matches, please. What? These last few days have been a dreadful trial. No food, no drink. But it's been the abstention from tobacco I've found most irksome. I don't understand. Huh? My recovery baffles even your special knowledge. Recovery? Yes, and matters improve by the moment. I hear the approaching footsteps, definitely not plodding, of a friend. Mr Holmes, is all well? All is very well, Inspector Morton, and this is your man. Mr Calverton Smith, I arrest you on the charge of the murder of one Victor Savage. Murder? No. You might add, Inspector, the attempted murder of one Sherlock Holmes. This is all wrong. He asked me here to help him. He's ill, raving. I might warn you, Mr Smith, that I'll take down anything you say, and it may be given in evidence. Please, do record what I say. I can't believe you'd accept the insane suspicions of a delirious man against the one man in England who can help him. The gaslight was the signal to me that you'd said enough. What have I said? What he invents, you mean? Mad slanders, which he has no corroboration. I came here at his request. Corroboration? Good heavens, of course. Do come out now, old man. <clears throat> Holmes, you have had me in some tight corners in the past. But this one... Do forgive me, Watson. <sighs> Squeeze behind your bed, for heaven's sake. I am so sorry. My room doesn't lend itself to concealment, which in a way has been an advantage, since our visitor was less likely to suspect the presence of a witness. <laughs> Isn't that right, Smith? My work, Holmes. Would you ruin work of inestimable value? Won't your research notes survive? But... My understanding. And how many would you have murdered in pursuit of that understanding? Inspector Morton, you'll find a small ivory box in the right-hand pocket of his coat, which it would be as well to remove. And handle it very gingerly. Yes. Put it down here. That's good. It will have its part to play at the trial. And now you may take him to the station. Very good, Mr Holmes. Watson and I will join you as soon as I am dressed. Holmes. I still don't know exactly what's been going on here, but I do know you are dreadfully unwell. You will go nowhere until I have examined you. With or without my leave, eh? Mm. Oh, well, quite right. Uh, Inspector, on your way out, would you be so good as to ask Mrs Hudson to bring up some claret and biscuits? Doctor's orders. <laughs> Oh, 
And Mrs. Hudson, hmm? Do you understand at all what you put her through? Yes, I do. And regret it. But it was the only way. She had to be convinced of the reality of my condition since she was to convey it to you and you in turn to Smith. Then I congratulate you. You were sorely convincing. Three days of absolute fast. Mm. Then, Vaseline upon one's forehead, belladonna in the eyes, rouge over the cheekbones, and crusts of beeswax around one's lips. Most satisfying effect, don't you agree? Oh, most. Perhaps you should write one of your monographs on the art of malingering. Yes, perhaps I shall. You see, you must know, Watson, that among your many talents, dissimulation finds no place. Just as now, you cannot pretend that you are not agreed. No, I cannot. You accused Smith of allowing worthy ends to overcome all scruples about means. Haven't you done the same? <clears throat> he is a murderer, Watson, and I would have been his next victim. It is clear, is it not? that he's a brilliant man, but mentally unbalanced. His instability, however, has not impaired his shrewdness. It was essential that he believe his scheme had worked if I were to surprise a confession from him. To be sure of that, you too had to believe. Yes. This murderer had to believe you were dying, as I did, for several hours. Why didn't his scheme work, by the way? My correspondence, as you know, is varied. I'm always on my guard against any packages that reach me. And, Watson, listen. You'll recall I would not let you within four yards of me. Of course. A mere general practitioner with mediocre qualifications. But, my dear friend, that too was part of my performance. Well, like my gibberish about oysters and half-crowns, to produce a pleasing effect of delirium, I could not let you near me precisely because of my respect for your medical talents. There was no doubt doubt your astute judgment would see through my pretense immediately if you came close. So, am I forgiven? Shall we take care of the formalities at the police station and then go for something nutritious at Simpson's, hmm? I'm still rather weak. Would you help me on with my code? Watson? When Morton arrived, when you sprang your trap, Yes, what about it? You'd forgotten me. What? Behind the head of your bed, you say, the only hiding place in the room. And a deuce tight one. And whatever I hear, I must not intervene. Quick, man, if you love me, your very words. Don't budge, you say, don't utter a word. Whatever happens, until you give me leave. So there I am, crouched in a most awkward position, for much of the time with cramp, I might add, for what seemed like an age, believing my friend was... <sighs> and I slip your mind. Then I am not forgiven. Ah, uh, sometimes, Holmes, sometimes you can be so devilishly ruthless. In The Dying Detective, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Medicin, and Dr. Watson by Michael Williams, with Edward Petherbridge as Culverton Smith and Alex Jennings as Victor Savage. Mrs. Hudson was played by Joan Matheson, Morton by Philip Anthony, Staples by John Badley, and Young Victor by Sam Crane. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Dying Detective was dramatised for radio by Robert Forrest and directed by Patrick Rayner. <laughs>